whole community was one big family. If somebody was sick, your mother was sick or something, the other family, they'd all bring food over. You never wanted for anything. Your door, there was no such thing as a key. Your doors were always open. Then we could walk in any time. That's the way things were done, Fox Point. My mother worked during the day, like most of the women worked in Fox Point. Uh, she worked in a jewelry factory. Some of the women worked at Brown University cleaning. Some of the people worked on the east side cleaning. Those guys, when we went out, if we did something wrong, we met an old timer, and he'd tell us about it, and he'd go home and tell your mother and father about it too. So uh, we had to be on our P's and Q's all with them because they report back to Ma and Pa. And if they hit you, you better not go home and tell them anything because you'd get another beat on top, right? Fox Point, it's a place you'll never find another place like Fox Point. I don't, I don't care where you go. That's why I stay here. Yeah, and uh, I love Fox Point. Fox Point, a neighborhood in Providence, Rhode Island, where I was born and raised, is gone. It exists now only in the memories of the people who tell this story. My grandparents, like most of the residents of Fox Point, were immigrants from the Cape Verde Islands, a former Portuguese colony. Cape Verde is a small archipelago of 10 islands, 350 miles off the coast of West Africa, and slightly larger than the state of Rhode Island. Uninhabited prior to discovery, Cape Verde was colonized by the Portuguese in 1462. Ribeira Grande on the island of Santiago was the capital and the first permanent European settlement in the tropics. The settlers engaged in commerce and the lucrative slave trade on the nearby Guinea coast of West Africa. Slaves were brought ashore here at the first slave market in West Africa for the transatlantic slave trade. Here are the voyage 1785, Captain Peter Wanton. Owners, John Brown, the brig Providence. The biggest slave traders in the 1700s were merchants from Rhode Island who prospered from the triangular trade between New England, Africa, and the West Indies. Pirate attacks and the declining slave trade in the late 1700s pushed the capital inland to Praia. By the time slavery was abolished in 1869, almost every slave in Cape Verde had escaped to the interior of the islands or was freed. Today, Santiago, the largest island, is home to over half the country's 400,000 people. Cape Verdeans evolved as a mix of Portuguese settlers, Africans, and European voyagers on sailing ships stopping in Cape Verde for supplies and water. The official language is Portuguese, and the mother tongue is Creole, a mixture of 16th century Portuguese and African languages. In this poor country with limited natural resources, Cape Verdeans, predominantly Catholic, anxiously wait and pray for chuba or rain in this drought-stricken land. Then the markets are full of the staples of the Cape Verdean diet, coals or kale, barbara, squash, fijon, beans, and mij, corn. Beginning in the 1700s, Cape Verde suffered devastating cycles of drought and famine, where up to half the population died. Emigration was the only escape, and Cape Verde's strategic location at the crossroads of the Atlantic provided the opportunity. Cape Verdeans, especially from the islands of Brava and Fogo, were skilled seamen willing to work for low pay. 18th century whalers from New Bedford in Nantucket, Massachusetts stopped in Cape Verde to pick up crew and supplies before heading out to hunt for whales. As the whaling industry declined in the late 19th century, Cape Verdean whalers began settling in New Bedford and Nantucket and turning to land occupations. Women and families poured in after 1892 when Antonio Coelho of Brava bought the Nellie May, an old fishing schooner, and began the Brava packet trade, carrying passengers, mail, and cargo between Cape Verde and New England. Most of the first wave of immigrants were from Brava, the tiniest island known for its high altitude and lush vegetation. And the Morna, the music of the soul of Cape Verde, carried with us in the winds that guided our little ships across the Atlantic. The packets were owned mostly by Cape Verdeans, with dashing sea captains in command. 
by 1920, almost 40,000 Cape Verdeans arrived in the ports of New Bedford, Massachusetts and Providence, Rhode Island, America's two oldest and largest Cape Verdean communities. When the Ernestine come, came to Providence, the first house they came to was Mamai's house, 88 Pike Street. It was the crew and also the captain of the Ernestina and also the Madeline. The door was always open to them and they felt at home because, like they said, they were in a strange country, but it wasn't strange to them because my wife made them feel like, you know, part of the family to them. And oh, how proud if one of the captains was related to you. Poppy, says Ananda Oliveira, put on his World War I regalia, standing ramrod straight beside his brother, Captain Cruz of the Madeline. Auntie Pat and Aunt Catherine got to pose on the deck of their uncle's ship, and even Cracker got to come along with Uncle Bobby. It was a huge event in the community when the ships arrived. I remember rushing down to the pier with my father to welcome the new arrivals and get news of the old country. The ship stayed in port for weeks, loading drums and trunks packed with food, clothes, and supplies for our families back in Cape Verde. We didn't have much in Fox Point, but every household sent something back, knowing that friends and family waited, anxiously searching the horizon for the ships coming from Providence and New Bedford. Without us and the schooners, they would die because the Portuguese government provided nothing. The old people talked a lot about Nyantera, the old country. They reminisced with horror about the Tempo de Fomi, the great famine of the 1940s. They talked about the hard life and poverty but mostly about the families that they'd never see again. Já pra pa mi tata bai Mi tata ba pa de chebu Hoje é tristeza De chá minha mãe Minha cretinha, minha amigo Well, when they left the old country, you know, it was such a major situation when they came to America. And I remember my grandma saying that. She said to her grandma, when will I see you? And the grandma said, not till the next life. You know, this is, you're in this country. Next time you see me, we'll be with the deals, meaning with God. And uh, my grandma cried and stuff. So they would put their music on. And that's all they had, those old records, scratching stuff. They smoked their pipes and they'd be sitting there crying for days about so dad, a longing, a yearning for something or some place that you may never have again. And it was just so touching her say, are you crying again? And she'd say, crying for my mother, my father. I once tried to explain to a woman what a Cape Verdean was and where we were from. She just looked at me and said, what an obscure people. I've been called everything. Black, white, nigger, pret, portuguese, black portuguese, matisse, high yellow, or some kind of funny Puerto Rican. But I'm not, and this is a Cape Verdean American story. What happened to the Cape Verdean community here in Fox Point? What messed us up and pushed us out here? Well, the first thing that happened was uh, the people who lived around here, they, they gave up all the houses around here for, on account of the church here. They was figuring on, the, the only one that stayed was my mind, that's all. My house, that's the only one that kept their house. Everybody else sold out and got out. 
Yeah, that's too bad. Keep it in. Well, you know, they all talked. You know, they didn't know about it. They threw a few dollars at them. They, they thought it was a lot of money. But today, they're all sorry because they're all scared. Now, today, it ain't like before. All the Creoles used to get together. All the Cambrians used to, I don't care who it was. Everybody was family. But now everybody's scattered, 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 you know. They scared a lot of the folks down there. They moved like Pike Street. Majority of people moved out, except the elves. They're the only ones that stayed behind. In fact, they just named the street after the elves family. Because they've been there all these years. Elves. 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 The Owls family prepared for the street naming ceremony with the mayor of Providence and city officials at the home where their parents, Rosalina and Anton Owls, raised 16 children. The word went out. Fox Pointers came back from all over for this celebration. I looked at my cousin David, born the same year as me, one of 30 Android first cousins, holding one of his nine children. Was he remembering Sundays at Granny's house when we did the twist and learned to dance to Cape Verdean waterness? Waving back was his father, Uncle Simon. Uncle Charlie, Aunt Pat, Uncle Tinny. Aunt Beatrice is always ducking the camera. The Brito clan in the back, the Ramuses, Deleuze, Oliveras, what were they thinking? Ties that began in Cape Verde, across the Atlantic, span generations, family, friends, and neighbors. Was Uncle Charlie thinking of the skinny kid with green eyes from Nantucket who arrived in Fox Point and stole his heart? Uncle Tinny and Uncle Simon reminiscing about the waterfront just behind them, where they worked as longshoremen unloading lumber and scrap iron. Or Johnny, hanging out just around the corner on a Sunday with the fellas, looking sharp. And who could forget Mamai and Papai, the house where everybody dropped in for Jag, the Cape Verdean soul food of rice and beans, and their famous pork chops. So sad, so good. One last song and dance to the lively beat of a coladera with our beloved Vicky Vieira, the voice of Fox Point. Johnny Pina on the leftovers, hitting that electric beat we learned to dance to before we could even walk. These faces have been playing and singing to us for decades. Was this the funeral of our history, erased before it was written? Our anchor was pulled up, and we were set adrift. I think you're looking for what you missed. You're missing what you didn't have, and you're looking for that. I missed what I had, and it's gone. This story is a quest across oceans of memory and time, searching for the Fox Point of the past and the parts that survived. My journey began many years ago with my grandmother, telling me about her voyage to America. What I, what I was born. I was born in the Gulf East. St. Vincent, I did live there quite some time. From, in fact, I came from St. Vincent Island. Well, how did you meet Grandpa? He brought to me to Everett Island, asked my mother, Machine. What island was he from? Tintin Town. Remember the name of the boat that took you over here? Tavoya. How long did it take for you to get here? 48 days. I threw up first of two days after I got here. <laughs> My name is Eugenia Forts, and I was born November 14, 1911 in Brava, Cape Verde Island. My father sent for us in uh, 1919. The name of the boat was Melissa Trask. Cape Verdeans were the only people from Africa to enter America voluntarily. 
until 1921 when Congress enacted immigration quotas that set a limit on the number of people, including Cape Verdeans, allowed to enter the United States. We just walked out of the boat, went into the office at Merrill's Wharf and gave your name and the whole thing, and that was it. But not anymore. But it was great to come to America. It was the new land. The immigration legislation was preceded by the Literacy Act of 1917, requiring immigrants to be able to read in their own language to enter the United States. They would ask them to read this paper. And immigration, of course, being from the British Isles, only could, uh, only and so, of course, English as well, but did not read or write Portuguese. So they hand them the paper, and little cave ready women from the old country would look at the papers, and being from little villages and stuff where the men went, were educated and the women weren't, they would read the paper and they'd say, Ai, ai nya mai, ai nya mai, which of course in Creole means, oh my mother, oh my mother. And immigration would snatch the papers and say, stamp them and say, pass. They thought they were reading, they were reading this paper in Portuguese. They were only making a comment in reference to this paper. And it was the funniest thing, and they, they sent word out to each other, just say, I am my, you can come to Africa, you know. And all I know, I was excited because we used to go to come to this country to see my father, because my father was here, you know. It was two or three years before we hadn't seen my father, see. And then we were all excited because we used to come to see my father. And he was going to a new country, you know. They were talking about the country, how nice this country was and everything else, you know. We were all excited. Well, I, I, well, we got in the ground a pit, you know. We thought about sugar at first. It said, what is this sugar? And it said, that's snow. It came from up. And then we were walking, oh boy, I, you know, I thought it was so nice. I wasn't even cold. When we got to New Bedford on the boat, we were quarantined for three days. And the, the health the people came in and checked you out. And, of course, we had three days of very calm weather that the boat didn't move so our food supply got a little low and we were, didn't have green vegetables we had rice and beans and corn and that kind of thing but everything was dry and when we got to new bedford one of the first things they brought on was green vegetables and cabbage was one of them of course we've had kale that we have, but I had never seen cabbage, and oh, I love cabbage to this day. <laughs> Cape Verdeans provided cheap labor for New England's fields, factories, and textile mills. Rhode Island became the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution in 1793, when John Slater built the first cotton mill in the town of Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And then we moved to a company house. They used to call it a company house. They owned those houses. They charged you very cheap as long as you work for them in that meal. When I turned 13 years old, I said to my father, I don't want to go to school anymore. My father said, you better go to school and learn something. And I said, no, I don't want to go to school to go around with those little kids. I don't want to go to school. This time they had put me in a, in a second grade. You know, they jumped me the, the grade because instead of the talking, but I was doing good and other things, you know. And uh, then I said, I'm going to work. I want to go to work. I was 13 years old. I said, I want to go to work in a mill. My father said, it's up to you. You don't want to go to school? Well, it got to be one or the other. So I went and told my principal in school that I want to go to work. He said, how old are you? I know that you had to be 14 you know, to go to work. I said, I was 14 years old. He said, I want to see your bird paper. And of course, it was written in Portuguese. He said, I'll keep it for a couple of days, and I'll let you know. In a couple of days I went, he gave me the paper to go to work. He didn't read it because he didn't <laughs> read Portuguese. So he gave me my paper and I went to work. I've been working ever since. Rhode Island's first port was built in 1680 in the Fox Point section of Providence. The addition of railroads at the ports in the 1830s attracted factories and industry to the city. Irish immigrants working on the railroads in the Blackstone Canal project settled in Fox Point in the mid-1800s. Azorians and Cape Verdeans, both from Portuguese colonies, also settled in Fox Point. Them old Cape Verdeans always tell you, you're Portuguese, you're Portuguese. Listen to what they said. The reason why they said that is because at the time we were under Portugal, and Portugal had a heavy foot on our people. 
And even though they had a better life in this country, they wanted to make sure nobody was going to be hurt over there. They gave it a second thought, like, you know, a Portuguese, oh, clear with you, oh, Portuguese. Although they chose the house of Creole, you're Cape Verdean. But they definitely never said anything bad about Portugal because they had that terrible fear their government would come down heavy on the people. So they left that alone. And I think people need to understand that. But the tension between white Portuguese, onion bobs as we call them, and us, the Cape Verdeans, black Portuguese, continued in America. When I was a child, um, I remember when we moved to uh, <coughs> Christian Avenue, well, it was more or less a white neighborhood, and um, when one of the kids say, uh, Ei, Prata da Brava, uh, that, which means, you black Brava. And I was so hurt because I was only a child. And for that reason, I didn't like the Portuguese people. But uh, that was, it didn't matter because I was only a child. But if they approached me and said those words today, I'd tell them off, but good. So we stayed to ourselves, living along the waterfront and taking the jobs no one wanted. Well, the majority of the people that lived around the port down there were all Cape Verdeans anyhow. The majority of them guys used to work the Colonial Line and also the Providence Line, where a lot of cotton for all these mills in Pawtucket and the Bedford Plow River would all come in there. And these old timers had to take these big iron uh, hand trucks. I mean, oh, they were terrible. My generation started with my father. He was the uh, worked the he worked the coal ships. That's all he did mostly. We worked the coal ships. It was a back-breaking job. No certain days, no certain hours. I remember my father, when his boss would come and call him three or four o'clock in the morning, come on, Tony, we got a barge. And they had to go down, had to go and go to work. There was nothing you could do. I felt sorry for him, but we didn't realize what he was going through in those days, you know. Really was tough, really was tough. The thing that I dreaded seeing the most was Marshall Williams' uncle, Spaniel. Oh, Spaniel, yeah. Spaniel. yeah. They were loading, he was wrapping up a load here. They threw the wire underneath, and he was on his knees, reaching under to get the sling. Get the sling. Stanley Montero, the dress his soul, was on the winch, and he was picking up a load from here to go out. And he's, he's, up, he's a winchman up here. Now, he, he, he didn't see him there. And he picked it up, and as he picked it up, it, started, it swung, and it, went, it just smashed. I mean, it hit him, and, and Spaniel looked up, and I, them words ring my ears. He said, Stanley, why you kill me? And that was it. Oh, and the guy died right there. I never, never forgot that in my life. Conditions on the waterfront improved after 1933 when Manuel Culito organized the Cape Verdeans and started the first black union on the eastern seaboard. But once you all get organized, we work so many hours, and uh, the pay have to be the same. In those days, some guys would get more than some of the other guys. The stevedores, the guy that's well known, he'd get more than the little guy on the, down the bottom because he, there was no union. But once they got the union, and they couldn't do that anymore. Right on the heels of the union, a group of men, led by Frank Freitas and Genoncino Mello, split off from the Santiago Society, a club with members from Connecticut and Rhode Island and began the St. Antonio Society, created in 1934 and Rhode Island's first Cape Verdean beneficent organization. My grandmother, Jens Celestina Andrade, one of the founding members of the club, was the Receptador, or dues collector. The club acted as an insurance company paying sick and death benefits to dues-paying members, who were mostly unskilled or illiterate laborers. The Depression also brought severe hardship to the Cape Verdean community in rural Cape Cod. In East Wareham, my mother's parents, Serafina and Matilda Montero, struggled to make ends meet for their 10 children. My mother didn't like to talk about working in the Cranberry Bog. So I asked George Layton, an old friend of my mother's, to tell me what he remembers. My mother and father were itinerant agricultural workers. They worked on cranberry bogs, strawberry patches, blueberry bushes, that was their, their work. And that was the first form of occupation 
that I learned about as a boy laborer. And in the middle of this wetland, there's a projection of land, and on there used to be a two-story shanty in which we lived. That shanty had no running water. It had no inside toilet. It had no electricity. It had no telephone, no mailbox. We had no car. All of the getting around was by foot, and that's where we lived from March until late November, early December, each year. All our lives were surrounded around the work on the cranberry bog. We weeded the bogs, we sanded, we planted the vines. The harvesting was by stoop labor, hard, back-breaking labor. They never gave me gifts, never gave me bicycles or baseball bats and so forth. But they gave me two things, a strong constitution, believing in hard labor. My mother used to say to me in Criollo, when she told me to do something and I began, she would say to me, trabajo nunca engana sedono which means that work never betrays the worker. Non-whites couldn't get store jobs, uh, whatever. So it was housework, cooking or cleaning. But that was my life because you couldn't do anything else. You weren't, a, you weren't allowed to. It was just <laughs> as bad as the South, as I tell them. It's, there's the south and up south. Well, we, I lived in up south. My mother came to uh, the United States when she was 19 years of age. She tells us a funny story. Right? The lady of the house asks her, says, Minnie, we used to call her Minnie for short, uh, do you want coffee or tea? And then uh, she says, no, I, I, I don't want anything. And then the lady says, well, would you like some cocoa? And she says, uh, you eat it yourself. <laughs> In Cape Verde, Creole dialect, uh, cocoa means bowels. <laughs> <laughs> or shall I say S-H-I-T? <laughs> Even with education, the door was closed if your skin was the wrong color as my mother's friend, Reverend E. Naomi Craig, recalls. I was the only colored girl that took shorthand in typing. I loved it. I used to take down the minister's sermons in shorthand, type it out, and he would be so thrilled. He'd say, oh, you can do this. While he was, while he was talking, I could take it down. And I practiced all the time. When I got out of school, there wasn't one job. I said to the teacher, all of these girls that I've taught, all of these girls that I had to help, they're finding jobs and I'm not finding any. So she called up downtown and she said, Naomi, you can go down. You have an appointment. So I went down. I was dressed. I had blue shoes. I had a blue suit and a white blouse and I had a navy blue hat with a little white around the edge. I was looking good. I went down there. There was this crummy looking little woman. Yes, she said. You're Miss Jennings? I said, yes. She said, well, we have a job for you up on East Side taking care of these twins. I said, oh. And uh, she said, and that's a good job, and I think you should be glad to take it. I said, but what time would I be having for my shorthand and typing? Oh, my dear, she said, there's a depression on. Didn't you know it? And if the white girls can't find jobs, what makes you think that you can find one? I said, I didn't think working in an office had anything to do with the color of my skin. I thought it had to do with my ability. I said, see, I have a certificate for 100 words a minute in shorthand, 80 words a minute in typing, and I can't get a job. She said, I'm sorry. She said, but that's just the way it is. And I said, well, thank you. She said, you don't want the job? I said, no, thank you. And I just went out. 
And you know, I didn't even know I was crying. If she had taken an arrow and shot me in the heart, she couldn't have been more effective. My mother, the first in her family to graduate from high school, gave up her dream to become a nurse. She said they weren't taking colored. Besides, it was the depression and she had to go to work. By early 1938, my mother and her sisters had left the Cape and were doing housework on the wealthy east side in Providence with reminders from their elder sister to send money back to their widowed mother. In September, the deadly hurricane of 1938 roared through Providence, inundating downtown and battering the nearby Fox Point neighborhood. People seeking help didn't turn to Holy Rosary, the Catholic church in Fox Point, largely because of a priest whose mistreatment of Cape Verdeans, black Catholics, was notorious. I hate to say it, but the church did not hold strong for many of Cape Verdean Catholics because when they went to get what they could get, clothing or whatever, from them, they would turn them down. So in doing so, uh, one of our Cape Verdean uh, leaders had started a Cape Verdean uh, uh, Protestant church on Sheldon Street. The Sheldon Street Church was built in 1905 by Manuel Martin, a Cape Verdean from the island of Mayo in Cape Verde, as a mission of the Central Congregational Church and the first Protestant Cape Verdean church in the country. One of the important places in Fox Point for me was the Sheldon Street Church. My family was a Protestant Cape Verdean family, which is unusual, but my mother um, had lived once behind a Catholic church in Fox Point, and she didn't like the treatment that she saw being given to some of the Cape Verdeans who came to the door asking for help. And so when she could, she became Protestant. Now, the, that was a place where people went for help. It was a place where we had our afternoon teas you know, my mother and some of the other ladies would organize these afternoon teas, and um, they would have entertainment. Of course, the kids would do the entertainment. I remember Roger Valls one time singing Chattanooga Shoeshine Boy on stage with a couple of the other guys from the neighborhood, appropriately attired with their shoeshine boxes. And um, I can remember Isidore Ramos from East Providence tap dancing. Oh, yeah, he was quite a tap dancer. And um, Mary Perry singing Ave Maria, and myself, of course, I did a little dance. My mother was already a Protestant because her uncle, John Diaz of Brava, started the Protestant movement in Cape Verde. When she moved to Providence, she became an active member of the Sheldon Street Church, where she met my father, who had converted from Catholicism. They married in 1940 and moved to Planet Street. My parents, two older sisters, and I lived upstairs, and the Lima family lived downstairs. At the bottom of Planet Street, Uncle Charlie and his family lived above Mr. Burns' garage. Upstairs from them were the Mauricios, Rosie Lima's brother and his family. And around the corner on South Main Street were Pat, Rosie and Manny Mauricio's sister, and her boys. In front of the house were the Delgados lived, who were related to the Mauricios. And around the corner, well, the checkerboard of family, cousins, aunts, and uncles continued all the way down South Main Street. Scattered throughout Fox Point were other immigrants, Eastern Europeans, Greeks, Lebanese, Gypsies, and Jews, who had small shops and businesses. Most of my homes are owned by Jewish people. You know, all of South Major is all the secondhand stores, all Jewish people. You know, the shoemakers, uh, Louis Himmelfarb was my landlord, and he had, uh, we sell good and used merchandise. And if we couldn't pay the if we couldn't pay the rent, nah, see me when you get the money. It was only like twelve dollars a month, or whatever it was. Everybody knew Jaffa, who was Lebanese and owned a little store on South Main Street. Jaffa sandwiches. He used to give you oil, <laughs> gallon of oil. Wipe his hands without washing it. You know, Jaffa me a sandwich. <laughs> He's going to make a bologna sandwich. The best best tasting sandwich in the world. The best tasting sandwich in the world. He had good sandwiches. He's a good guy. If you didn't have any money, you know, he, he would uh, put it on the book. You know, Jeff was just a good person. He was kind, considerate. He knew, you know, that who he was dealing with. You know, people didn't have too much. And, you know, Jeff didn't have too much needs. You know, Jeff, Jeff was an immigrant. You know, and, uh, but he had just a little more than we had. So he knew we couldn't pay cash. He would have to wait 
whenever we get the money, you know, I guess every two weeks, every 30 days. Didn't you have a little book where you'd mark Yeah, the book, put on the book. Put down credit. He never ran shop because, you know, if you didn't pay him, he'd stick it on his bill. <laughs> never, yeah, never ran right, shop. Right. Mr. Anthony's on Brook Street was a favorite stop for pickles and penny candy. And Mr. Anthony and his wife were wonderful people. He used to give us candy too for a penny. I never forgot that. Till the day I stole the, tried to steal an apple. It was the driest apple in the world. Guess what it was? A potato. I went in the wrong basket. I put my hand in my, put my hand, I put it in my pocket. And he called my mother and told my mother I was, I was trying to steal an apple, but I stole a potato. My mother made me peel it. I had to cut it up and I had to eat it just like that for supper. Then I had to go down there and apologize and give him his money, full money now, for uncooked apple, I mean uncooked uh, potato. I was so embarrassed. And my mother said, look him in the face, look him in the, I couldn't, I said, because he was so nice to us. He, he said, why did you steal from me? I said, because I meant to get the apple and I didn't, he said, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Why, I said, well, I didn't mean to take, I said, well, I'll tell you this, I would have never took your potato had I knew it was a potato. I was being honest, I wanted the apple. So he made me sweep the floor and he gave me an apple. I sweep the floor. But that's how they solved things in those days. What really kept the boys out of mischief was the boys club. From the moment the doors opened in 1916, the boys club on South Main Street served the urban poor and kept the boys away from the dangers of the streets and juvenile delinquency. The club was a haven from crowded, cold water tenements with limited indoor plumbing or pull chain toilets. When I speak about the old boys club, I speak with feeling. My first home was the boys club. I was kind of raised up in the boys club. We moved from Tarkwarton Street to 255 South Main Street, right to, almost directly across from the boys club. Now I have my own shower, I have my own swimming pool, I have, I have my own gymnasium. All I had to do was walk across the street from my house to the boys' club. At that time, you, it was seasons. You had a basketball season, baseball season, softball season, um, floor hockey, uh, whatever the season. Vocational classes, contests, special events, and sports kept the boys off the streets while their parents worked long hours on the waterfront, factories, or as cooks and domestics at nearby Brown University and the wealthy homes on the east side. Movies were a nickel, and the annual talent show and parents' night was always a hit. A highlight of the year was the annual Christmas party that drew hundreds of children. It was more than a club. It was a brotherhood where friendships were forged that lasted a lifetime. World War II pulled the young men away from Fox Point, where they served in segregated units. Even George Lemer, our downstairs neighbor, who was a commissioned officer. Back in civilian life, they married, had children, and introduced their sons to the boys' club. Two generations of Andrade men grew up in the club. As a girl, one of the only times we got to go into the club was for the Halloween party. But they did set aside an hour on Saturday morning at the pool for the five or six of us girls who lived around the club. Sometimes the lifeguard was Uncle Tony, one of the club's championship divers. The parking lots outside the club behind my house were playgrounds for our gang, all of us friends and cousins. As soon as the cars left the lots at the end of the day and on weekends, we took over. In the summer, we'd be outside from sunup to sundown playing hopscotch, seven-up, hide-and-seek, softball, and kickball. Our street was a hill that ran straight into the Providence River. By the 1950s, when I was growing up, the river was polluted and smelled a high heaven at low tide. We kids called it the stinky old river. If the ball went out of bounds and rolled down the hill to the water, it was an automatic out because there were huge water rats and nobody wanted to go down there. Sometimes we'd go to the top of the hill and sneak in over the fence of the big yard, a big grassy space with the best roll downhill. That's until the people inside the John Brown house saw us and chased us out. Then we'd go a little further up the hill to the Brown University campus, where we'd roller skate down those long, smooth paths. Or run errands on South Main Street for our mothers. 
I remember running back from Jaffa's down South Main Street, passing old timers with their stern faces and the old country rhythm in their walk. You always saw somebody you knew. I'd peek into the bars along the way, maybe see the big girls all dressed up, just getting out of work or headed downtown. A little further down was the Union Hall. It was always busy there, especially on payday when the guys would shoot craps out in the back. Here comes Uncle Tinny, wearing his pork chop hat. Maybe he was on his way to the Three Lantern Bar over on the corner of Pike and Brook Street. That was where the longshoremen hung out, and it could get kind of rough. Providence was the second best port on the whole East Coast. The waterfront provided jobs for almost 200 longshoremen. Thanks to Sonny Bento, the savvy business agent for the union, they had a pension plan and good benefits. My father worked the boats to pick up extra money. Whenever a big load of scrap iron or lumber came in, he'd get up at the crack of dawn, grab his hook, and head down to the union hall for the shape up. Everybody went to work with a, with a hook, and you walk and talk. Just make your load, and there were four, part, four different sets working in a hole. The only time you come out of the hole was when you had to go home and eat. Right. <laughs> Hey, there's no big belly long shopping. All that spending all day long picking up that lumber. That's right. the guys in good Everybody shape. was in shape. Everybody was in good shape. Yeah. They come yeah. 12 o'clock, they blow the whistle, go to dinner. The guy just fry up that ladder 40, 50 foot high, but climb up like it wasn't nothing, you know? There were times these ships, the ships would come in and the cooks, if they had a decent cook on his ship, you know, he'd say, well, fellas, wait till after I feed the crew, whatever I got left, I'll put out for you guys, you know? And they'd give you something to eat. But now, there's the bulkhead here, and the porthole, and the galley <laughs> right there. And this guy, this cook, I mean, he was doing pork chops, getting ready for lunch. Had a whole pan, say the porthole is here. Jones is over here, the sign man, making sign for, for the cargo going in a hole. And he kept smelling, and he looked, and he watched again. And the cook had a whole pan here. Every time he'd pull the pork chops off, he'd throw them in there. And every time he turned his back, Jones would look and reach in the porthole like that. He'd have to turn his head. <laughs> and he kept grabbing them and putting them in the bag. <coughs> and the cook couldn't figure it out. Everybody, well, we watch, we watch. <laughs> Finally, he saw the hand just coming out. He waited, didn't say anything. He waited till the next load come. Jones turned his back. He moved the pan and took a Another pot, hot grease, put it there. And when he went back, Jones went like that. And you know, I've never heard such a scream in my life. Believe me, I mean, pork chop was hanging off that pork chop, pork chop grease. But you guys remember that? Yeah. Oh, that was, that was, it was sad, but it was funny. At the end of the day, the men would leave the Port of Providence on Allen's Avenue and head back to the point. Maybe they'd find a good card game, or just hang out in front of the Three Lantern Bar. If they bumped into the chief near the barber shop, they'd catch up on union business. Or maybe just step inside the bar to see who was there. Longshoremen by day, musicians by night. They play for Cape Verdean clubs, like St. Isabel's, a women's organization, a saint famous for its cultural activities and dances. The women at the Sinton Town Club were some of the best cooks in Fox Point. Mrs. Lima arrived early on the day of a party and began preparing huge pots of conja, chicken soup, and jacasita. People would almost come to blows about whether one of the main dishes was called manchupa or kachupa. Upper Islands, you know, they, my mother, people in all of them all said for manchupa, kachupa, kachupa. Well, the low islands, Brava and Fork and everything, Munchup. There's a difference there. So I tell them I like it all. I said, no problem. Now, you know that the Kachupa, though, came from the upper islands. And my grandmother was Brava and stuff, but I, I have to stick strong to that because Kachupa was made in Santa Anton, San Vicente, Bovista, San Nicolau, the upper islands, and it spread down to the other islands. The Jag came from the lower islands, Brava and all them, and worked its way up the other way. And that's why the Bravas have their own jag, you know that. 
with the shit, with the cornmeal and the shitting, with the uh, the beans, the linguiça, the the barbara, which is a summer squash. All that's cooked in together, and it's very tasty, by the way. After dinner, people would stand out on the porch and wait for Flash and his sister Vicky to arrive and set up for the dance. You could hear the boom, 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 boom of the electric bass, guitars, and violins of the Creole music warming up all the way over to our house a block away. I'm Flash Vieira. Tavares. I have to put that in too, you know. And we got our start at um, Holy Name. Uh, Gano Street, Power Street. As long as Vicky was by my side, there was no problem. And as long as I was by her side, there was no problem. <laughs> because back then, my mother wouldn't let her go out anywhere unless I was with her. You know how the old folks were? Oh, my, my. Said, I'm your boy, yeah. Pamela Bar, Nayes, Laranjinha, Hoje em dia, tudo tá vai. Quem tem servido, do you casca, la laranja? Um passo na rua de alfanga, ou de um grupo de preto, uma branco. Perguntar que grupo. Era aquilo Olha que coisa É um gru Laranja The firstborn generation swung into the 1940s. Providence had a reputation for pretty girls and good dancers. The jitterbugs hit the old post road that ran from Rhode Island down the Cape. Or headed to New Bedford to the Gee Dances, short for Portuguese. After a late Saturday, the Jitterbugs would be up early on Sunday for Mass and later take a stroll down South Main Street. And South Main Street, we used to call that uh, Broadway of Providence. Sunday morning, all those guys come down with our zoot suits. I mean, we were mad, weren't we, with our zoot suits and our chains. I mean, that's where everybody congr come together and we, from there we'd go different sections of the city. But that was a meeting spot. That was Broadway of Providence. South Main Street. Did you have a suit Gass suit? Yeah. Oh, I had come my on, suit me. suit, yeah, mm -hmm. my long chain. Yeah, Gatsby Hall, all these different halls. I wish I'd have kept it. I wish I'd have kept it. You'd never fit in it. <laughs> Sundays on South Main Street, it was nice because the men used to put on their uh, phantom light shoes their peg pants and their hats, and they were dressed. We would uh, leave our house, and then everyone had like a little clique, like, you know, like our friends, and we'd get dressed and we'd go down South Main Street and go to Miller's Spa, have a little banana split or an ice cream soda or whatever. Then we'd go down, take a little ride, we'd go take a little walk, we'd go down to Catalos and listen to the Cape Verdean bands that were there, you know, and everybody was there. It was nice. We had a parrot, and, well, we had a curfew. We used to go out, but we had a curfew. At a certain time, we had to be home. So that parrot, when we used to sneak coming home, and he used to hear us, he used to tell my Mother, here they come, here they come. And then he used to, ha, 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 you're going to get a beaten, you're going to get a beaten. My mother get up, and you know what my mother used to do to us. When the grown-ups were at work or went out, we'd go to Granny's house. Granny's Kool-Aid, sugar, and fresh-squeezed lemons was a favorite for the grandkids. Hands crippled with arthritis. We knew there were Oreo cookies, peanuts, and banana sandwiches, linguiça and eggs to go with the Kool-Aid. <sighs> Granny's house, or Control Central, as Uncle Dinky called it. Every Sunday after church and on holidays, 
Granny was at that stove making conjure, red kidney beans, manchupa with manjaka. Aunts, uncles, cousins, we packed that five-room apartment. Uncle Tony, always taking movies. Doing the twist and learning to dance to Cape Verdean music by watching Granny and her sons. And Grandpa would calmly walk through a sea of grandchildren. With Anton Maria, a beloved family friend, watching over all of us. If we weren't at Granny's, we'd visit family in New Bedford. Take a summer trip to Grandma's cottage on York Street in Nantucket. Drive down the Cape to East Wareham to Granny Montero's house in the middle of woods, blueberry bushes, and cranberry bogs. And for all of our big parties and events, everyone went to the Cape Verdean Progressive Center in East Providence, founded in 1951 to serve the immigrant community. People came from all over for the first celebration of the Mastu. Built like a ship's mast, decorated with greens, fruits, breads, vegetables, and put up in Brava between June and August to celebrate the Saints' Days. I only remember going outside the Cape Verdean community for school, church, and the Girl Scouts, but we never, never, never went to the black community. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you what I remember. The expression gentis pretus, black people. When I was a boy in New Bedford growing up, I heard said among Creole people that I knew, you couldn't, uh, you weren't supposed to call, uh, associate with uh, 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 people in the West Side. That was the attitude. I remember being told of some Cape Verdean girls who were ostracized by the Cape Verdean community because they had something to do with some people up in the west side. That's what I was told. What would the basis of that animosity be? I don't know. I think, I don't know, but I assume the um, racism that existed subtly, covertly, that was the explanation. It didn't pay, it doesn't pay to become associated with a, a, a group that was disfavored. Cape Verdean society, society is like the Brazilian society and the Cuban society. We see it today with them. You had those that look like they're Bronx, look like very European, very white, and could be your sisters and brothers. Then you had the other bunch that was very dark, very African. All of a sudden they come to America, now we're, we're splitting with, we're not part financially, we're part in color-wise. And I'll never forget, Tilly King was downtown, and he told me, he said, he saw different ones working on the counter, cosmetic counter, and he said, oh, those are my cousins. And uh, one Irish kid said to him, a friend of his, those are not your cousins. Said, yes, they are. So he said, no, no, he said, those, um, the little Irish kid said, those girls are white. You know, they don't put white girls, they don't put colored girls on a cosmetic counter, they put them on the elevators and stuff, right? So he said, those are, I'm telling you, those are, those are cousins of mine. So whatever way it went, the little kid went and told somebody else, told somebody else. He got back upstairs in the, in the office of the Shepherds. <clears throat> and next thing you know, the girls lost their jobs. They told them they could keep the jobs, but they could take on their jobs as elevator operators as opposed to working on the cosmetic counter. Of course, the girls in the elevator operator well, didn't want them there either because many days they worked by them and they didn't talk. The only jobs that we could get was running an elevator in the department stores. It was very humiliating at first because I would see the same girls who were stupid that I taught, who didn't know, were in the office, and I was running an elevator. The Cape Verdean community in Fox Point was able to build a buffer against discrimination because of our control of the waterfront, the main source of income for the community that made us self-sufficient. Our lives revolved around the longshoremen. Their annual picnic was a party for everyone at the point. As usual, Aunt Pat, one of the best cooks in the family, had a hand in making the food. And her brothers, Kenny and Bobby Oliveira, brought it in for the home team. 
The second generation born in the 40s and 50s like me were still wrapped up in the cocoon of our neighborhood and families. By then, American-born Cape Verdeans were making a mark in the outside world. The American dream of education for the children in Fox Point became a reality in 1954 when a brand new elementary school was built. This was a school that your mother campaigned for all around this neighborhood. She was going around for people to sign to have a new school in this area. And they built the school down there. It wasn't really in this area where they were going to put it in the beginning because it would have displaced so many people. So they put it down there where there were no houses, right in the Takwatan Park. And that's where the school was. And your mother was the one that was going through the neighborhoods, getting people to know that we were going to have a new school here. My middle sister was in one of the first classes at the new elementary school. And me, the youngest by far of my sisters, entered there in kindergarten. My sisters were academic stars and gifted musicians. My oldest sister was the first girl from the point to go to college, closely followed by my other sister. I remember the frantic preparation for the feature story in the Providence Journal, complete with my father sitting in a Nazi and Harriet pose behind us. Later that night at a big benefit dance for my sister at the Cape Verdean Club in East Providence, I posed again at the wishing well for contributions to a college fund and filled with dreams of a brighter future for the new generations born in America. My parents were inspired by Eugenia's work with the NAACP and her commitment to education for minorities. She tirelessly championed civil rights and still remembered to carry Cape Verdean soul food to George Layton, who had gone on to a distinguished career in law, the NAACP, and civil rights. I know George loved Manchu, so um the NAACP convention was in Chicago that year, several years ago. And um, so I said, gee, George likes Munchoop, and I know he's married to an American girl, and I know she can't make it. Or she doesn't know. You know, you wouldn't make it. So I made a pot full, and I got a small a pail, oh, a hold about three quarts or more of Munchoop and couscous, too. I made some couscous, and uh, so I said, I'll wrap, freeze it and take it, because I knew I'd get, you know, a few hours from Boston, you get to Chicago. So I called George and told him that I had brought it, and George flew over and got it. Greater love <laughs> hath no Cape Verde for another than one would go from Hyannis, Massachusetts, to Chicago, Illinois, with a pot of manchupa and a serving of couscous. <laughs> it was the 1960s, and weren't we sharp? Looking sharp, spending all Saturday morning getting that hair conked, but it was worth it. Looking pretty, swaggering down Brook Street to Wicked and standing on the corner to see and be seen Longshoremen on a day off, a Sunday, holiday, or Easter. Whatever day it was, you know you could count on Johnny and his boys to be up to something. Oftentimes, we, when, when we got over, the guy said, right, let's go, let's go to Boston, let's go here, let's go there. You take Fox Point, put it on a trailer truck, and I'll go. I'm not leaving Fox Point. Everything, everything I want is right there. What you all your stores, your restaurants, your gas stations, the boys' club. Uh, you know, I didn't need to go anywhere. I didn't have to leave Fox Point. For the Andrade gang, Granny's house was still Control Central on Easter Sunday in 1969. The first great-grandchild getting some of Granny's famous linguiser and eggs. My gang from Planet Street, me and Shell, important teenagers now, even though my father still pulled us by the ears. Donna digging for boogers, and Mel without her front tooth. My cousin Kathy came up from the Cape with her family, Woody still acting the fool, and cool Daddy O Joe with his dark shades. Now we posed on the wall of the lots where we used to roller skate, Shell being Sophia Loren, and me showing off my new bell bottoms and loafers, with Fifi, Shell's cousin from Connecticut, just hanging out with the big girls. Over off Well Street, Woody and Baba were turning from frogs into handsome princes. 
While we were self-absorbed teenagers, our parents were beginning to get letters that a renewal project to upgrade the east side had been approved by the city and the federal government. The first time I knew that something was happening in South Main Street was down by the pool. And the city came and put horses in the middle of the street. And we asked, what are you doing that for? He said, we're going to make this in one way. I said, why? He said, you know what? He said, they're going to knock down all them horses. That's the first time a uh, city worker I said, no way. No way. Urban renewal and gentrification in Fox Point meant Cape Verdean removal. Scores of Cape Verdean families were displaced. They told us, well, we're going to fix these houses up. We're going to knock some of them down. We're going to fix them up. And you're going to be the first ones that come in. But little that we know, you know, we couldn't afford these houses here. The Providence Development Agency can't, said that the families had to move. They were going to do this, they were going to do that, they were going to do this. So the people, they panicked. They panicked and a lot of them got nervous. They started to move out. Some went to East Providence and they went to different areas. When I lived on Wickedon Street, my landlord wanted us out. He jacked my rent up $300. If I was paying $300 then, you know, I would have, he was charging me 600 bucks. He said, well, he said, you know, because of the tax, and whatever they were excuses they used, we have to go up on the rent. I said, oh, that's not, no problem. I thought it was going to be something reasonable. He said, well, you're not going to like it. I said, what are you doing? 300 bucks. I said, no. I said, you want me out? What are you that bad? I've been here 20 years, man. You want me out? Which house was this? The one on uh, the one where the coffee shop is at now. Yeah. I had the same thing it. happen, Claire. But Almost the, double my rent. Yeah. And I found another place. By, but he did by me luck, a favor. Just by luck. Now I got to go look. He forced me to buy. He did me a favor. The few who owned put up a fight to avoid having their homes condemned. I knew that this was a catch here. We had the Fox Point Neighborhood Association then. And in that association, we found out that we could fix our houses up and we could still stay here and we could live here. We fixed our places up, those whose, whose houses need to be fixed up. This neighborhood looked great. And those who figured that, well, where they're going to tear down different things here, we might as well move, moved out but they were sorry that they moved out because after they moved out, the rents went sky high. Well, my mother said that she was not going to move. The only way that she was going to move was they would have to take her out of there in, a, in her coffin. So finally, she called up John Murphy, which was our councilman at the time. So he came to visit her. And he also brought Robert Clarkin, which is our councilman now. And she told him, she says, John, they want me to move. She says, after all, you don't move mountains. So could you please help me? He says, uh, Mrs. Alves, Mamai, I'll see what I can do for you. Today, our house is still standing, and we thank John Murphy. And he told him, he came and he told him, Mrs. Alves, you are saved. You can stay. Your house is, you don't have to move. The construction of Interstate 195 began in the 1960s and cut the Cape Verdean community right in half. Johnny was part of the fight to push 195 a few hundred feet over to save his house. I'm an owner now. They wanted to expand, they're going to expand 195. Now they were going to take my side of 195 and knock my house down again. You know, because I owned the house, they had to inform me, give me that information about 195 and expansion of 195. But if I didn't know, there I go again. I got a beautiful story for you. When they had the meeting to move me out of where I'm at now, where they asked they were gonna expand 195, the meeting was at the Fox Point School. 
Fox Point School. Not, not the guy from the Fox Point School. But on the on the board they had a chart and they had my house, Red X, along with a few other people Red X. These are the houses they're gonna get rid of to expand 195. So we made a big stink about it. You know, we had a lot of people there. We were prepared. The only because we we're all homeowners. If we wasn't, we we're going again. So the story I told them and the place is packed. I said, my father came here in 1910. I exaggerated a little bit. My father came here in 1910. 45 days it took him. He landed down there by the art club in Fox Point. Nowhere else to go. A stranger coming from a different country. My father worked on the railroad, and he worked at Dex Dexter Farm, Farm, and he was a longshoreman. Bullwhack. He worked hard. Five years later, and he sent his girlfriend. She landed at India Point Park. We lived on the corner of Top Gordon and Travis Street, right up the hill. They got married, and here we come. I love it when I tell it. Here we come. Here comes the Brittles. Never left Fox Point. Lived right there on Top Gordon Street. Every place I went and I lived, we got this place, Top Gordon Street, on my house, South Main Street, Wickedham Street. Now you want to tow me out of here? I said, I'm not going. The Sinton Town Club wasn't so lucky. They were notified in 1966 by the redevelopment agency that their building on Power Street was condemned. Their building was knocked down, and they were forced to leave their home since 1949 and relocate to the far end of Fox Point. In 1974, the club was in trouble. Membership was dropping as Cape Verdeans were leaving the point in droves. Only a handful of members were there in 1984 to celebrate the 50th anniversary dinner and the acknowledgement of the club by Senator Chafee and Mr. Mello, who had served with distinction for decades as president. So the club sat there, alone, in the shadow of Interstate 195 that reshaped the destiny of Fox Point for future generations of Cape Verdeans. Interstate 195 cut straight through Fox Point, except where it zigzagged around certain areas and landmarks, like the Holy Rosary Church. On Why that, are people on afraid to talk about the church? You don't have to well, answer I'm not, that. Oh, no, no, yeah. no, Why? No, because no, I try to ask everybody, people start. I'm not evading that. Okay. I'm saying that the church sits in this island, as, as you put it, and on the, on the other side, the eastern side, where the four or five houses were, remember there's a barber there, the Fonz family lived there, a couple of other families who I, I can't re recall their names. But those houses had to go, and all that became was a parking lot. Everything else goes around Holy Rosary Church? No. Tell me about that. No, I'm not gonna talk about that one, no. Okay. Because it's, it's... No, I won't, I won't, I won't get on that subject. Well, I just... I, 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 as much as you want to, and then let it go. I felt that they didn't have to move. I, I, don't, I don't know too much about it. First they said they wanted to build a Catholic school, you know, and they were going to, they wanted to do this, they wanted to do that. And through all these years, they've never done nothing down there. All them people moved away for nothing. The Holy Rosary has the uh, parking lot facing Travis. They have the parking lot facing uh, Brook Street and they have the cross the street. Down the street from the Owl's house was the Three Lantern Bar. After it was condemned in the late 1960s, Uncle Bobby and his friends reoccupied the bar. It was reborn as Poor People's Park, the unofficial refugee camp for Cape Verdeans who still lived in the point and those who had been displaced. Uncle Charlie, my cousin Charlene, Toddy and Al Pereira and Manny Perry played deep chords that would make your heart cry. And we were crying because we knew we were losing the point. Poor People's Park was bulldozed in the early 1970s. Manny Almeida's Lounge was the Cape Verdean's last stand on Wickedon Street. It was Cape Verdean turf where the worlds of the longshoremen and locals mingled with students from nearby Brown University. But the negative perception from Brown University and the wealthy people on the east side about Manny Almeida's, and by extension the Cape Verdean community, was a deadly combination. Brown had, somebody in Brown had put out the story, and I don't think it was all of Brown, that Fox Point was very hostile 
towards students and they wouldn't be nice to him. And as far as I can remember, all the students that came down, everybody was nice to him. Everybody was nice to the students. Because a lot of kids were from away, away from home. And um, I, you, know, you ask anybody, any of the kids came from down, even those that are, that are grown now, married and everything else, they never had any problems in Fox Point. And we never, as kids in Fox Point, we never had no problem with the people up on Cook Street and all those houses up there. They were wonderful to us. The wealthier people, we used to go there Christmas, for Christmas and sing uh, concerts, do Christmas carols and stuff. And they would give us all kind of uh, gifts of fruit and everything. Oh, they were wonderful to us. And I wouldn't say anything bad about them. They were just wonderful. But the way they made it sound like it was them and us, and that wasn't true at all. The community lost the tug of war between Brown University, Interstate 195, Historic Preservation, Providence Redevelopment Agency, and Holy Rosary Church. After Manny Almeida's closed in the early 1980s, Wickedon Street became quiet. Now this Brown University is taking over now. And all these little fancy shops on uh, Wickedon Street, coffee shops and uh, antique shops, and the old timers could come back, they wouldn't believe what was going on. You know what gets me so mad is now, the other day, this, now they call Fox Point the Lower East Side. And I told them, I said, this is not the Lower East Side, this is Fox Point. I said, I've been born and raised in Fox Point, you know? They call it the Lower East Side. And I think at this time, I'd like to introduce the man who uh, made today possible, Mr. Robert Clockett. Right. Thank you, Mayor. I can remember in the middle 1960s, meeting the matriarch of that family, Rosalina Elves. It was when the redevelopment agency wanted to tear down the Elves' home. John Murphy had just been elected to the city council, and I was a Democrat ward chairperson. I accompanied John to some of his meetings with Rosalina. She asked John, to stop the redevelopment agency from forcing her to move. John said that he would fight the agency on her behalf. And any of you people that know John Murphy, you know he was good in a fight. He won, and the Alves won. And their home was saved. Because of Interstate 195 and the redevelopment, many families had to move out of this area. Most like the Alves, did not want to move. And if you meet any of them, and you ask them, where are you from? There's only one response you will get from them. It is, I'm from Fox Point. Even, even if they now live in East Providence, Pawtucket, North Providence, or wherever they reside today, you can hear the pride that they have for the point. <laughs> This happens to be the name of the island that Papai was from, Boa Vista. We all tried to hang on. Aunt Pat and Uncle Charlie were forced to move, and they went to East Providence. At their house, Uncle Charlie, as usual, got the music going, but it didn't feel right. It just didn't feel right. Ay, que nunca no contraba, papa sufriba, esta sufri. Nya tristeza, catacaba. Nunca me esperava se meu pai se despedir. Na tristeza que te acabou. Nunca me esperava se meu pai se despedir. Ai Deus, que sabia isso era assim. Um dia botânico. Today, the Boys Club, now the Boys and Girls Club, is the lonely survivor of the Cape Verdean community in Fox Point. They survived because they woke up just in time. Well, we were here, we wasn't political, politically involved. 
when Toddy ran, Toddy ran for the council seat. And he says, look what's happening. He said, they want to take the Boy Scout. He didn't say they took South Main Street. They want to take the club, Johnny, our home. Mm -hmm. If we can fight them, the politicians can fight them, Johnny, but they're not doing nothing. You know, what do we have? What does the politician do for us? You know, nothing. We just went on, you know, so we like this. He said, if we get involved, you know, look how much paper it is we got. We should get involved. We had a big meeting. And he told, Dick White was the uh, executive director then. And he told the alumni, you know, there's money, there's government money that we can get and build a club somewhere in Fox Point. On May 3rd, 1973, Marcus Andrade, my uncle, at that time the president of the Fox Point Boys Club Alumni Association, signed the contract for the construction of the Boys and Now Girls Club with the contractor and the president of the Boys Club Board of Governors. When they closed the doors here, we marched, Fox Point alumni marched. We closed the door here, we marched down the South Main Street, up Wickham Street, to 90 I Street. We had the police, Fox Point Boys Club members that were on the police force, the fire department. We had the trucks, engine two trucks, people from the community, the kids, the alumni marching from here to our present location, which is 90 I Street, and just around the corner of Wicked in the Night. When was that? That was January 27, 1974. That was a Sunday. We opened the doors January 28. I think 74. You know, as, as Bobby was talking, I couldn't help but remember when I first became mayor back in 1974, there was a real celebration that went on and it had to do with the uh, dedication of the Fox Point Boys and Girls Club. And I said something there that I never thought that would hold true for 30 more years or certainly 25 more years, certainly through three decades. And that was that Fox Point would continue to be an example after all these years of people living together from different backgrounds, different races, different heritage groups, and still sharing in a commonality of good neighborliness. And that's what Fox Point, I think, means to me. On April the 4th, 1998, Pike Street has been changed to Alves Way. We were the oldest family in Fox Point, and we were the only family living there. They decided that it would have been nice if it had been named Alves Way after the family, and we appreciated every. I don't, I don't know, but I, I play the lottery, and I play it to win, the big money. If I ever won a hundred million bucks, I would bring my people back to Fox Point. Good friends, God is the great and the only builder. And unless the Lord builds a house, those who build, build in vain. So we ask your blessings, Father, on my niece, Claire, who you put that planted the seed in her mind to bring this project to a successful conclusion. We ask you to bless her and to bless all of those here who have helped her in this endeavor. Hi, Claire. As I said last night, all praises come to God. And I thank him very, very much 
for his putting all this uh, beautiful thoughts in your mind and let it, letting it come to, to pass. I thank you for this opportunity, my brother Flash and I being there for a very special night. You take care and the peace of the Lord be with you and all around you. So long for now and God bless. Faithful share.